He is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter to you. Welcome to our time of worship. If you're new, I'm Pastor Josh. If you are gathered together in Rhinelander at our Rhinelander campus, greetings to you, Easter greetings to you. Uh, we are grateful to God to minister and to connect and to be a community in this way. I am excited this morning to be celebrating our risen Lord together with you. And so I'm going to jump right away into reading two Bible passages and then praying and then we'll get going. Uh, the first is Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. Please follow along as I read. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Okay, the second passage is in Romans Chapter 6, verses 8 through 11. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God of life, your spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Your spirit inspired the prophets and writers of Scripture. And your spirit draws us to Christ today and helps us to acknowledge him as Lord and so we ask for a soul-level awareness of your Spirit right now and that he would give us deeper insight, encouragement, faith, and hope as we focus on the risen Jesus through this time in your word. It's in his name we pray. Amen. When I was growing up, our family had a view master. Uh, if we were together in the same room, I would ask for a show of hands for how many people have looked through one of these before. If you have not, because you have never looked at something that's not digital, you've like never seen a non-digital photo before, uh, then I'll just explain it to you. A Viewmaster is a stereoscope, and you look through it like you would a pair of binoculars, except you're looking at what's called a reel, which is a thin cardboard disc that contains seven stereoscopic 3D pairs of small transparent color photos on film. Personally, I can place myself in grade school, in probably the early 80s, in my family's living room, uh, looking through one of these with the light of a lamp as the light that I needed to be able to see the photo, maybe listening to a children's book at the same time that I'm watching the stereoscopic pictures in the Viewmaster at the same time. It's visceral for me, the memory is. Uh, these were originally introduced at the 1939 World's Fair before TV, and they were meant to show just different destinations around the world, different cities, different countries, different places to visit. In fact, at the time, a lot of gift shops carried postcards and Viewmaster reels, and that would be your souvenir. But the key for the Viewmaster to work is two different photos, and they're typically photos with the same focus from slightly different angles. 
And that brings a measure of dimension and depth. Friends, here's the thing. This Easter morning, what I'd like to do with you is to look at two different photos, if you will, from Scripture. Two different passages with the same focus. And the focus is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but from slightly different angles with the goal of bringing some dimension and depth to the Easter story this year. That's my goal. That's my focus uh, with you today. We'll look more closely and at more length at the first photo, passage number one, Mark 16, one through eight, and then we'll look briefly at the second photo, passage number two, Romans 6, eight through 11. At the end, my goal is to kind of bring them together with one combined picture for us this Easter morning. Does that make sense? That's what we're doing. So, photo number one, passage number one is Mark 16, 1 through 8. And the picture that we see here is this. Uh, Jesus had died, and on the surface of things, it looked as if he had been killed by the Romans with the influential Jewish leaders pulling all the strings behind the curtain. But in reality, Jesus had given his life willingly for us. And as of verse 1, he was alive. Mark 16, verse 1, Jesus is alive. And these three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, uh, were the kind of diligent, proactive, responsible women that took it upon themselves to purchase the spices and to enter into the difficulty, frankly, the sadness, the discomfort of anointing a dead body of their Lord, of their beloved Lord. They honestly didn't expect that he would not be there. They were expecting him to still be dead and in the tomb. So the text tells us in verse 2 that it was the first day of the week, that's Sunday, and it was very early, and yet the sun had just risen. So the light was coming in low off the ground. The shadows were long. The ground was dewy. Only a few people were out and about. Then we read in verse 3 that the women were chatting with one another about how they would get into the tomb with such a massive stone rolled in front of it. And this little chat kind of demonstrates a few things. First, the men probably should have been there with them. I think that's Maybe what this chat demonstrates, first of all, to me. It's a little convicting, actually. And yet the women were being faithful to get this done as soon as possible, and they were figuring things out as they went. Now, I am not trying to throw any of us men under the bus at all, but isn't this the case sometimes with many of us men? Not all men, not all the time. But sometimes, it certainly seems it was here. Someone needed to help with the stone. Often we should be present, but we're not. Meanwhile, the women in our lives are trusting the Lord and they're figuring things out as they go along. So let's all just be grateful for the women of faith in our lives that are trusting the Lord and figuring things out as they go. Amen? Mothers, aunts, sisters, cousins, wives, grandmas, friends. They're featured with prominence in Mark's resurrection gospel account. And that stands out to me as a challenge to us men that I kind of want to accept and I want to simply be willing to be proactive and present more. Anyway, what happens next in verse 4 is a God timing sort of thing, isn't it? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. Uh, Have you ever wondered about something and then bam, the Lord just provides? Uh, I was talking this week with a friend of mine who recently gave his life to Christ. Praise the Lord. He recently fully expressed belief and surrender, belief in and surrender to Jesus. And we were talking on the phone and he was explaining to me the changes in his life and how he was overwhelmed with all of these little things that he was noticing that were God's provision in his life at just the right time. Like his eyes, like the blinders had been taken off and he was seeing that God was providing. That was these women. 
willing to step out in faith, willing to serve and honor the Lord, not knowing how it would all happen, and looking up from the ground, which kind of indicates this downward sense of uncertainty and, and, I don't know, despair. And yet they look up and they walk around the corner in the garden and they see the giant stone so big they would not have been able to make it budge on their own, but to see that it had been rolled away and the tomb was open. It was both helpful and startling. They didn't know if Jesus' tomb had been vandalized. Uh, they didn't know if his body had been desecrated or stolen. They, they had to initially be very afraid. Not as much hopeful as afraid, probably, initially. What if someone had taken his body? What if someone was still in there? What is going on? The detail of what they saw next is so wonderful and so in line with the way that Mark writes. We learn uh, from verse 5 that they entered the tomb. They saw a young man sitting. They saw him sitting on the right side. So the detail is, is really specific. And they noticed that he was dressed in a white robe. And as a result of all that the account records, we also learn that they were alarmed. Well, I would think so. This is an alarming situation. And their alarm is only beginning because the young man, clearly an angel, is about to speak. In verses 6 through 7, we get to read a record of what this angel said to these women. And what he has to say is spoken in short burst staccato type of communication that the angel had to know was exactly what the women needed. They were so overwhelmed, the angel could not use too many words. Uh, It's like that, by the way, with couples and some of the weddings that I do as a pastor, especially when we get to the point of the vows. You cannot use too many words all at once. You have to be very careful. This is something you learn after a little while as a pastor. So, beginning with the groom, I hand the bride's ring to the groom. I direct him to place it on her finger, on her left hand, right there. Yes, that one. Place it on her finger. And then repeat after me. We begin simply with the name. I, John, take you, Jane, to be my bride. You, you, you got to go slow. <laughs> you got to give him. You got to give him a chance to respond. I, I've done it the other way. I, John, take you, Jane, to be my bride. And I've had the groom just look at me like that's too much. I, I, that's my name and her name, and the fact that she's my. I, I don't know if I can, if I can get all of that together. We pastors have to keep the vows to short bursts for grooms and for brides. By the way, it goes both ways. So that's what the angel did for these women. That's the way the angel speaks to Mary and Mary and Salome. I envision it could have even felt a little like this. Hey, ladies, ladies, it's okay. Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, yes? Are you with me? Are we on the same page? Jesus who was crucified, yes? Well, get this. He has risen. He's not here. Are you tracking with me, ladies? See? Look at the place where they laid him. Now, listen. Go. Go tell the disciples, and especially Peter, that Jesus is going to Galilee. Say that word with me. Galilee, he says. There you will see him just as he told you. That's what I imagine. I I don't know if angels have humor. I don't know if any of that was at all just this amazing moment of praise and relief uh, in, in those moments, but also of fear and being startled. But this angel gets to announce the most important thing that has ever happened in the history of all humanity. And he does it right there. At any rate, in verses 6 to 7, the angel just lays things out so very clearly for the women. But verse 8 explains that they went out and fled from the tomb, 
for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And honestly, that's where Mark's account ends, at least originally. Now, there are 12 more verses in our Bibles after this. Uh, that have historically been included in Mark's gospel, but they are likely not original to Mark. The earliest manuscripts of Mark's gospel don't include the last 12 verses. The earliest manuscripts of Mark, Mark's gospel that we have, copies of it that we have, end at verse 8, with the women being just freaked out and silent after being told that Jesus was alive and given instructions to go and tell what was happening. And frankly, this is more in account with the style of Mark, the way verse 8 ends Mark's account. And friends, we can trust the account that we have in verse 8. And that's exactly what happened. One commentator said this, poor women, rather than following the angel's instruction to go and tell, they are so stunned by the incredulous truth that they say nothing, and their silence lends its own authenticity to the proofs of the resurrection. Anyone who has stood in the presence of God loses the glibness of a smooth and ready tongue. Trembling hands, whirling mind, and faltering heart, these are the after effects of meeting God face to face. Fear so ties their tongues that Jesus will have to confirm the fact of his resurrection by personal appearances in addition to what was certainly their belated spoken words at some point after this record ends. The women were so startled that they ran away without saying anything to anyone. Now, that doesn't mean they never said anything to anyone. I mean, we have the record of their firsthand account, but at least initially, they were like the grooms and brides that have looked at me in stunned uncertainty (laughs) as they try to figure out the words one after another. And that's true of our human experience, isn't it? Sometimes, isn't that the truth? No need to add all the extra verses at the end of Mark's account. It's okay that we stop here at verse 8. The bottom line is, listen, Jesus lived and Jesus died, but Jesus rose again in the tomb was empty. By the way, Wendy and I have been to Israel, to the location of what is believed to be the tomb of Christ in Jerusalem, and you know what we can confirm? It's empty. Friends, we can believe Mark's record of the angel's words, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. He has risen. He is not there anymore. The angel declared it, Witnesses at the time confirmed it, and we can believe it today. So that's photo number one in our Easter stereoscope this morning. It's the empty tomb. Photo number two, or passage number two, is Romans 6, 8 through 11. And the picture that we have here is one from a couple, three decades after Jesus' resurrection. The focus of both pictures is the empty tomb. The death and the resurrection of Jesus. It's just that the angle of the first picture is from the day Jesus arose, and the angle of the second picture is from 20 plus years later. It's in a time where the alarm had worn off, and Christ followers were learning to find their identity in Jesus' death and resurrection. You see, when we trust Jesus and believe he really lived and died and rose again, then there is a very real and very personal kind of dying to ourselves and living for God. That's what Romans 6, 8 through 11 really brings out to us. Dying to ourselves and living for God. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about in verse 8. This is Romans 6, 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. What does it mean that we have died with Christ? Well, because humanity is broken, in a sense, we've already died before we were even born. Ephesians 2 teaches that. Spiritually, we don't come alive until we're united with Christ. 
We are saved through faith, and it's a gift of God, not by our works. Believers were dead in their transgressions, but were then made alive in Christ. So there's that. It's a thing that we can't control so much. It's just a part of the reality of living in a fallen world. We are dead because of our broken sin nature. But then there is this self-denial form of death that is a choice. It's a willful resolve. And the Bible talks about that too in passages like Luke 9.23 and Romans 12.1-2. In Luke 9, Jesus calls those who are following to daily take up their cross and follow him. There is a death involved there. Romans 12.1-2 talks about being a living sacrifice. There's a self-denial and a surrender of ourselves that's a sacrifice we choose. And we are called to choose. We're called to choose in a moment. And we're called to choose on a daily basis before the Lord. That's what Paul means when he writes that we believe in, in uh, verse, verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. There is an ongoing belief. This phrase is an affirmation of volition, of decision, of choice. Our lives hinge on God's call and our response of belief. Do you believe? Have you heard the call of God and have you responded with repentance and belief? To believe means to choose. It, it literally means to choose to die and to rise with Christ. And that creates a changed life. And we get to see those changed lives in our community as we walk together through the ups and downs of life. It also means we come to know certain realities when it comes to Jesus. That's verse 9. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. We know, which means we trust, we experience, we hope, we have faith, we have evidence. We know Jesus lived, died, and rose again. We know that he is now alive and he will never die again. We know that the same impending end of life that we all face has come and gone for Jesus. He rose from the dead and he conquered death once and for all. Death no longer has dominion over him. That's verse 9, Romans 6, 9. Those are the words. We know he is living now and he will never die again and he will live for eternity. Jesus is alive. We know it. Jesus said himself in Revelation 1, I am the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And so we know whatever our situation, whatever our troubles, we know the promise of life. It defines us. It has started now and it will last forever and that gives us hope and peace. And so because of this victory in Jesus, which is the title of the sermon, by the way, victory in Jesus, his life, because of this victory in Jesus, according to verse 11, we can consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Whatever it meant for Christ, is what it should mean for us spiritually. Our surrender in a moment, and also that ongoing lifestyle of self-sacrifice, all of that is directed towards sin. We have died to sin. These are the words of Romans 6. Which, by the way, we have been describing lately in our Romans series, defining the word sin uh, by observing its spelling. I is in the middle. When I am in the center of it all, that's sin. Sin is a worship disorder. Sin requires me to be the main focus and everything else to revolve around me. When I am in the middle, that's sin. So to die to sin means to die to the need to relentlessly focus on ourselves. And friends, what a freedom that brings. <laughs> to die to the need to relentlessly focus on ourselves is a gift of the Lord. And then to live to God, to die to sin, to live to God means that our posture 
is toward God, and we seek an ongoing relationship of trust and hope and commitment to God to know Him. Friends, understanding this is where we find our identity as believers. Our identification as people is composed of all kinds of things. And it's fine to be identified with our work, our family, our friends, our ethnicity, our gender, our hometown, our heritage, and on and on and on. It's okay to be identified in, in those ways. But none of those are our identity. For believers, our identity is in Christ. And, and, and let me just tell you, when we get that straight, so many other things fall into place. There's a very real death and new life at the soul level in every true Christian. We believe and we're united with Christ in his death and in his life. And we're going to dig into more of that this summer as we continue to move through the book of Romans. And right now we're in Romans chapter 3, but we're going to get to Romans chapter 6 and we're going to cover these same verses again. But for today, I just want to put this text into the Viewmaster alongside our Easter text. So this is what we see. After having reviewed a bit of the Mark 16 passage and thought a little bit about the Romans 6 passage, this is what I want you to maybe dwell on together with me. There are two pictures of the empty tomb here. One is from the day of, the other is from two decades later. One demonstrates the reality, and the other stimulates our belief. And when reality and belief are overlaid, our lives are changed forever. I believe that. When we surrender and our identity is in Christ, then we have died and risen. Have you had this life-changing experience of believing in Jesus' resurrection? It is Easter Sunday morning. It may be that those of you tuning in, those of you gathered in Rhinelander are here because it's Easter and because this is a wonderful place to be. And so my question to all of us is this. Have you experienced that surrender? Have you given your life to Christ? Have you had this kind of life-changing experience? My greatest hope for you this Easter is that you would truly believe and truly live. I was studying for this passage just this week, and I came across uh, in one of the commentaries on, uh, on Mark. No, it was a commentary on Romans. And it was by uh, Daniel Doriani, who is a pastor and a theologian. Uh, he compared the result of life in Christ to an encounter between a cynical journalist and a children's TV personality. And I want to recount that for you as we close our time together. Around 2018 to 2019, Hollywood released two movies about Fred Rogers. And the thing is, Rogers had died in 2003, so a lot of people kind of wondered why the interest in him. But Doriani, the theologian that wrote the commentary about Romans 6, kind of postulated that it probably came in the wake of the contentious political season of 2016 and 2017 that the country had just come through. And by 2018 and 2019, they were just ready for some fresh air. And, and, and by the way, this is like worth our time to just pause for a moment and say, right now in the calm and the quiet before the storm of even more contentious uh, political types of times that we're coming into this year in, a, in an election, it is worth it for us to just say, let's slow down and pray. Let's, let's pray for our country and let's pray that we can be a people whose identity is grounded in Christ. That our nature, our character, our interaction with others is coming from a place of identifying with Christ. At any rate, in 2019, People were seeking direction, and they found some in the story of Mr. Rogers, this tender, this tender man who was committed in his life to, uh, to educating and um, strengthening uh, the character of young kids. 
Uh, the film A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood describes the friendship between Fred Rogers and Tom Janad. So Tom Janad was a sought-after writer at the time that he met Mr. Rogers in 1996. His magazine pieces bristled with aggression, and they were incisive and cutting and cruel and profane. So when Janad initially uh, asked for an interview in 1996, Rogers' handlers rejected him out of hand, even for just a 20-minute sit-down. But Rogers overruled them and said yes, and gave the writer hours and then days of access, fully aware that he might be intent on humiliating him. One day in the midst of all this, um, well, in the midst of the all-access kind of arrangement that Rogers had allowed Janad to have, Janad was in a car with Rogers' manager. They were on the way to visit the grave of Mr. Rogers' parents, and the manager asked uh, this, this writer, this journalist, what do you think's going on here? And Janad replied, well, an interview. And the manager said, don't be, I need, don't be naive. That's 20 minutes. He's taken an interest in you. Mr. Rogers had his reasons. He had nothing to fear opening up his life off camera to inspection. If anything, he was nicer off camera than on camera. Meanwhile, Janad hated himself for the cruelty of his feature articles. Did Mr. Rogers sense that in some way? Whatever the motive, Rogers and Janad became close friends, fast friends, and remained so until Rogers' final illness. That friendship changed Janad's life. The reality of the man and a close relationship with him, both came into view for Janad. Friends, by all, all accounts, Mr. Rogers was a genuine believer in the risen Jesus, and his reservoir of thoughtfulness and kindness to all, to children and adults alike, was a taste of God's transforming work. Have you tasted God's transforming work in your own life? Are you living in such a way that others taste that as well? That's the result of life in Christ. That's a picture of being alive to God. Consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Today, listen, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, that he is alive. We trust that. We believe that. And so the pictures we have are both of the tomb from the day of and from 20 plus years later. One is the reality. The other is a description of belief. Friends, will you combine those two pictures in your life to believe the reality that Jesus is alive? Will you trust him? Will you surrender your ways to him? Will you live in such a way that you continue to believe in him? That's my prayer for you today on this Easter. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that you powerfully moved all those centuries ago and that Jesus is alive and that we have access to you and that we can live believing in his life and death and resurrection and see transformation within us and the effects of that moving out into our lives, our family, our work, our friends. So today I pray for those listening online. I pray for those gathered in Rylander. I pray that your word would not, would not return empty, that it, it would have its way as you promised that it would that your Holy Spirit would make all the difference in our lives together as a community, that you would continue to do this amazing thing that you're doing, but that we would acknowledge you and trust you and live for you. We give you praise on this Easter. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you on this Easter Sunday.